Hi, everyone. My name is Halima Siddiqui, and I'm the executive coordinator here at Health Nexus. So Health Nexus oversees several provincial initiatives related to FASD. The FASD provincial website where you can find recent and up-to-date information about what's happening, learn more about resources and tools, and find out services available uh, in your local community. We also allocate subsidies every year to 40 plus support groups for individuals with FASD and their families. And we designed an online training for service providers from various sectors, including healthcare and nursing, education, mental health and addictions, justice and corrections, and community and social work. So uh, before we start the presentation, we would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous people of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, let's take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we all call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous people and their cultures. From coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we can each in our own way try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. A couple of house rules before we begin. During the presentation, you may be tempted to ask questions at the end about yourself or your loved ones with FASD. Please do not use any identifying information to protect people's privacy. By law, we have a duty to report to Children and Aid Society or the police any threat to a child or direct attempt to harm yourself or someone else. Presenters cannot provide clinical advice, as this would require professional counseling and more in-depth knowledge of the situation and behaviors at stake. Today's discussion provides information about latest research, evidence-based practice, or general education tips and advice. If you need ongoing support, please consider connecting with your local FASD worker for supports or join one of our Health Nexus support groups for individuals with FASD and their families. You can find this information on our website, fasdinfotosoft.ca. I'd like to begin by introducing our speakers. Uh, today, we are welcoming first Sherry Lynn, a mindfulness educator and children's author. She taught in the elementary school system for 30 years, working with children from JK to grade 12. Her major focus was to help children develop emotional regulation skills in fun and engaging ways. She owned and operated an outdoor education center and summer residential camp for many years, where she witnessed the impact of animals to bring children to the present moment. She completed her training as a mindfulness educator from the Center for Mindfulness at University of Mass Medical School. Uh, through her work with the organization Mindful Me, she focuses on sharing the benefits of mindfulness practices with children, teenagers, parents, and teachers internationally. This work is delivered through school system, sorry, through school programs like Mindful Buddies and the Compassionate Leader, where she uses rabbits to teach self-regulation skills to children. Sherry Lynn works cooperatively with Joanne Russell at Circle R Ranch to provide mindfulness with animals programs to children with a wide range of, abil of abilities. She has shared her knowledge of mindfulness practices and given workshops to parents, teachers, and students in Asia, Europe, and throughout North America. Sherry Lynn is a published children's book author. She's deeply grateful for the educators, parents, children, teens, and animal mentors who have shaped and deepened her awareness of the power of mindfulness training to impact overall physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Next, we have Jesse Jones, a multifaceted recreational therapist, artist, writer, educator, mother and wife, who runs a thriving practice, Just Jones Recreation Therapy, in London, Ontario. In its third year, the practice has grown to include a dedicated team focusing on a broad range of clients, particularly children, adults, and seniors with various needs. Concurrently, Jesse is a fourth year student at Brock University, working toward her honors Bachelor of Recreation and Leisure. Uh, leisure studies with a concentration in therapeutic recreation. Her commitment to her practice and education highlights her dedication to enhancing a holistic well-being through connection, creativity, and curiosity. We are thrilled to listen to both of their presentations today. Please uh, remember to ask your questions in the Q&A section, and I'll provide more information and links in the chat. Okay. Um... Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. I feel super blessed and grateful to be able to share our programs that we have offered with Health Nexus for in the past year. So we offer, I'm just going to put my little timer on here because I tend to talk a lot about what we are, what we're doing because it's so exciting. 
So we offered three different uh, programs. One was, well, two were in-person mindfulness with animals training at Circle R Ranch. One was uh, their two-day trainings. Uh, one was for nine to 12 year olds and the other one was for teens. Now in the past, we've offered these trainings on a 10, it's 10 hours of training. And in the past, we offered five weeks of two hour trainings. And this year we thought we'd do a little bit different and we offered a two five hour trainings. So we had the kids for the whole day and we definitely love that so much more. We also were able to offer it to, to children who live farther away. So we had some kids that actually drove like three and four hours to come for the training. The response to this training was inc incredibly overwhelming. We had hundreds and hundreds of kids apply. So it was really lovely to be able to offer them where they could just come for the full day. So we did that at Circular Ranch where they did, and I'll talk a little bit about the training as we go through, uh, two experiential um, workshops that were 10 hours in length for nine to 12 year olds and teens. And then in the winter time, we've offered um, online training before with mindfulness, um, mindfulness training for kids from four to eight year olds and from nine to 12 year olds. And the response to that was overwhelming. Also, there is definitely a need for online training. We ended up having a lot of kids from the north where parents said that um, there wasn't a lot offered for this type of self-regulation training. So um, that was, yes. it was wonderful. Yeah. We offered the training uh, online and um, the response was overwhelming. I'll talk a little bit about that as we go. We had hundreds of kids apply for this. Uh, we had two groups of 25, um, one group of 48 year olds, one group of nine to 12 year olds and one group of 48 year olds. And so that was um, six weeks of training and one hour a week for that training. Both of these programs always included a parent information night. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, that was part of the course. They also received a mindful journal and a family uh, mindfulness uh, resource guide to use throughout the training. So in our night where we um, presented the actual what the kids were going to learn we found over the years of doing this training that it it was really beneficial to explain to the parents what we were actually doing and why we were doing it and what the benefits were so we always define with the kids that we you'll have your own definition of what is mindfulness training but we it is for us it was focusing on the present moment in a clear kind and accepting way and one of the things that we also explained um, in the parent information night was why are we doing what we're doing? What are the benefits of being around animals? And what are the benefits of mindfulness training? And in addition to a lot of, a lot of when they filled out their applications for coming, a lot of parents were looking for, how can I help my kids develop this ability to pause and reflect before they react? Or to deal with these out of control emotions or how to um, help them in a school atmosphere with friendships or anxiety. And as we went through, and I'll talk about what we did specifically in the course to teach them those skills, we said these are the benefits of working with the specific mindfulness training um, and using animals to help us. So we always explained how does animal uh, assisted mindfulness training work. We teach specific strategies, uh, mindfulness strategies, and then we give them all kinds of opportunities to practice. So if it's in person, they practice them with the animals. They use uh, horses and ponies and rabbits and goats and pigs and chickens. If it was the online course, we brought those animals into this office. <laughs> I live in a farm. And so we brought the animals to class and they would teach the specific lesson. And um, also for the online, they had they brought their own pets or a stuffed animal where we practiced the strategies. So they would have these opportunities to practice. And then we provided home support through the use of a mindful toolbox. And I'll talk a little bit about that. The framework of practice, a mindfulness practice that we taught them for teaching self-regulation skills. We always started off with mindful movement. Um, some I'm a yoga teacher, so we always did some type of um, brain gym or yoga movement. We always used their breath uh, and talked about how the breath was an amazing tool to help them calm themselves down. We always included a sensory activity, whether it was on the screen at um, when we were teaching online or whether it was in person. 
we always talk to them a little bit about the brain, um, how their brain works and how we can help recover from outbursts, for example. We taught them how to use visualization and specific, we call them chillaxin strategies on how to calm their body down. And then we always had one element of um, emotion exploration. And then we assigned homework, whether they were in person or um, online where they use their mindful journal that we sent them. Oh, that's not going forward. We always grounded our practice in our favorite question. We always said to the kids, this, qu this question is our favorite question. You're going to hear it 45,000 times. And it is, what do you notice? And so whether we were playing it in a game, like with Rosie here, uh, the switch game, what do you notice before and after? And then we would take it to, what do you notice going on in your body? What do you notice going on in your heart? And what do you notice going on in your mind? And we explain to the parents how just bringing this question again and again and again to their children can create um, neural integration in their prefrontal cortex, in their PFC, that we need to develop their emotional regulation skills. The program that we taught, uh, that we teach with animals is, it's called a living qualities program. So we'll talk to the kids about what does kindness mean when you live it? We'll take each specific quality and we'll say, what does it look like if I were to hold this rabbit in a kind way, what does it sound like? What type of words am I going to use or tones am I going to use? And what does it feel like when we're experiencing a living kindness? And then we'll extend that and say, okay, if we're going to live kindness and we're out at recess time and, and somebody's struggling and having a really hard time and you see that they're struggling, what would it look like if I was going to extend kindness to them? So then we would take each of these qualities, teach it, practice it with the animal, but then give them an extension to be able to practice in a real life situation. We did this, for example, with the quality of impulse control. At the end of all of our sessions, we always had a, a celebration of learning where all the families and friends were invited. This one was um, with our nine to 12 year olds and we practiced the game. So the kids shared all of their learning. They played uh, one, two, three yoga tree for here where it's like red light, green light. They run and you say one, two, three yoga tree and you turn around and the families all have to stand on one foot. And we'll say, oh, you're building neural integration in Cindy cerebellum, the back part of your brain, um, just by practicing this game. Another one of the mindful movement challenges that we do in person, um, this is them showing their parents is they take horses through an obstacle course. And these two teenagers were living focus and living attentive listening. And their challenge was to take this horse through the obstacle course. And for this part, they had to stop where their, their forefeet were in the hula hoop. And then afterwards we would talk to them, what does it mean to live attentive listening? When you are talking to a friend or listening to a friend, for example. We always did breath work, be mindful of my time, um, where we had the kids match their breathing to their animals breathing. And really, this is incredible to witness to see how the animals affect a child's ability to ground themselves into the present moment. It's the beautiful, beautiful thing to uh, witness. We teach the parents and the kids all about how their breath can be used not only to calm themselves down, but also to shift emotion. For example, if they're really struggling, we'll say, what do you notice? Oh, I notice anger is visiting. And I say, oh, we can take all that anger inside us and do a volcano breath. We can take it all in and then go and send that anger away. And we'll talk about having, so we sent these home in their journal and they would be practicing them each week. We also did an activity called sensory awareness because we know that sensory skills are so important to children that have FASD. Um, this is a game called Fluffle Gazing Bingo where they re learn how to read body language of the animals and it shows how they're feeling. And so we'll say, you know, uh, we learned about when a, hor when a horse or a bunny turns their back to them, to you, what does that mean? What are they communicating to you? To you? So when you're in the classroom and you're working in a group and somebody turns away from you, what are they actually teaching us without even saying, we talk a lot about reading nonverbal body language. And one of the last things is, oh, here, um, is a sensory walk um, we'll do with the animals and we'll talk 
find the softest part of the body, find the sweet spot where your animal um, res responds to you. So we teach, there's a lot of other things, but I know I want to be really mindful of the time. Um, but I did want to say just one thing before we finish. So that's exploration, name it to tame it, um, animal exploration. The last thing, guided visualizations, but I just wanted to come to the very last screen. What we have learned in especially this past year is the value of teaching the parents the skills that we are communicating. And a lot of the parents asked um, if they could have input, if they could have practice in mindfulness and becoming more aware themselves and grounding their own practice. So we offered a mindfulness meditation for caregivers and we definitely would include that again. So we offered that halfway through the session um, for both and um, for both of the trainings and the parents, when we had them respond at the end to us about how can we grow as, as leaders, that was one of the things that they said they valued the most was we always say we're we're yours for the next whatever if it's three weeks or if it's seven weeks we're available to you um and my partner that i that i work with we both have taught for many many years and have worked with families and um, they said that that was the, what they found one the most valuable we always have a celebration learning at the end where the kids get to um share everything that they've learned and uh, and that's always really memorable too, especially when it's in person because they can take the kid, take their families and their friends around the camp and and show everything that they've learned, introduce them to the animals. Okay. So I think that's about it in its quick version of what um what, of what we do. We'll stop that share. I hope that's interesting, and we just feel so incredibly blessed to get the funding it's just we're just always do a happy dance when it happens because we feel super grateful thank you sherry um and i guess we'll pass the baton on to jesse now uh you're free to share your screen thank you good morning everybody my name is jesse and um uh, like halima had mentioned i am the owner uh, practice owner of jess jones recreation therapy and uh, we're really excited to share what we what we're up to this past year. So share my screen for you. We um, created London FASB Family Explorers Empowered Group. And within this group, we provided a program called Pathways to Resilience, a family leisure adventure program. And so the idea behind this program is that that is 10 weeks and we split the 10 weeks into two separate components. Um, so the overwhelming response of families could be split into two separate groups. And the first family group would um, have five sessions, so five weeks, and uh, each session was two hours in length. The really cool thing about this program is that it was bringing families together um, from all backgrounds and ages. We had grandparents, um, caregivers, um, birth parents, and adoptive parents, which I, I mentioned because, um, interestingly enough, in the um, in the uh, process to um, acquire families for the program, um, that was one of the big questions that actually came forth was um, who could attend? And of course we are a very inclusive space. And so it was interesting because that actually created a lot of really interesting conversations within the sessions themselves. The key takeaways of this Pathways to Resilience program is that it was therapeutic recreation based and that we were using leisure as the intervention to support the families and really meeting the families where they were in their journey. Um, so a holistic approach, really making sure that the dimensions of wellness were being met um, through the activities that we chose and really focusing on the five domains of wellness. So physical, emotional, social, spiritual, um, and intellectual. We really wanted to make sure that the families were being engaged and given the empowerment. So we were giving the family's tools that they could use outside of the sessions and so that they could take what they were learning through their leisure activities and take that into their everyday living. So of course this involved um, having them participate in diverse and interactive activities. So some of the activities that we did um, included nature hiking, we were out doing forest bathing, um, we had the families partake in art activities that were very reflective in nature. So 
um, really guiding the families through guided prompts that help the families make connections. So each individual family would have to consider, you know, individual family strengths, like the member strengths, members weaknesses, and then collectively as family, how do those weaknesses and strengths work within each other? And these conversations were really empowering for the families because then they would share them with the other families and everybody could have that collective conversation. Um, because of these interactions, this created a lot of community and connection. And the goal for us when we create the Pathways to Resilience is that the families are building a resource for themselves where they will gain the friendships in the group and then they will reach out outside of group. So some of the things that we also did was prepared on um, what we call personal practice. So every family at the end of every session would go home with something that that would further deepen their learning. And it was never a requirement, they didn't have to do it, but if families chose to do it, it would really um, support that additional learning from that particular intervention. So for example, one of the uh, take home personal practices for the families would be um, sit down as a family and think of or go on a bit of a treasure hunt um, online, virtually or in person to think of all of the resources in the community that you currently know of and how they support you. And then at the next session, they would come and all of us would share this and then collectively create one list for the families to have as a resource. So that was a really cool takeaway. Cultural and personal exploration. So the inclusion of cultural exploration and personal storytelling. Um, and we did this through um, other interventions such as drumming. We did lots of musical interventions, drumming, uh, singing, um, and then giving the families the opportunity to share their experiences and their stories and their culture. And then of course, skill development. So with each intervention and each activity and leisure activity that was chosen, it would offer opportunities for developing various skills, including emotional regulation, creative expression, physical fitness, resonating with therapeutic recreation's goal of skill development for enhancing quality of living. So the outcomes and support for families was, of course, resilience building. Through its structured activities, the program um, did aim to enhance participants participants' ability to cope with life's challenging, fostering resilience, and a key outcome for families dealing um, and being affected with FASD. This also helped enhance family bonds. So by engaging in shared activities, the families can would strengthen their relationships, improving communication and understanding among their members. While being improvement, the program's holistic approach supported improvements in overall well-being, helping participants to find balance and fulfillment in various aspects, aspects of life. And of course, the community support. So really making sure that our team was available to support them through um, all different transitions and to really support them through the feelings that they were feeling as, as bigger feelings came forth. Um, the really interesting part that happened a lot of times during our sessions was that the families would start off as a group and then eventually um, the adults would <laughs> all share a space and then the children would all share a space. And so I thought it would be important to share with you that some of the difficulties that we experienced with the program was actually of the varying backgrounds. So really for the first time, we really had to sit back as a team and um, consider how to continue to create safe spaces for people, um, cultural safety, um, you know, just the safety of um, our backgrounds and experiences. And so the reason I had mentioned previous for um, birth parents versus adopted parents was that really did come forward in conversations and it did create um, a lot of heated conversations. And it was interesting for us as a team to really have to sit back and learn how to navigate sensitive topics and to make sure that everybody felt included and that the leisure activities were being used to support those individuals in a, in a caring and respectful way. Um, but the other challenge we learned was that um, the varying ages of children within the family groups. So um, moving forward in the future, really thinking about how do we support individual families when they all come together who have younger children, but also the families who have teens or young adults, and how do we make that program work um, cohesively so that it didn't feel um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? It felt very uh, disjointed at times, uh, but then there would this be these beautiful collab moments of collaboration. So really kind of sitting down and evaluating how that affects future programming. However, overall, um, there was a lot of empowerment and of course autonomy and everybody who came really were given the opportunity to take charge of their growth, well-being and the one thing that we're really proud of is within each intervention and leisure activity that was offered, it didn't matter um, how they showed up, we were able to support and accommodate that leisure activity for wherever that person was, whether that was physically, mentally, emotionally, we were able to really support those individuals with navigating um, challenges that they perceived, um, whether they were real or uh, perceived to be real. So overall, really great, um, good experiences. So here we've got a few pictures, um, lots of art, lots of building, community building, uh, connecting with nature, lots of sensory driven leisure activities, nature, of course, um, cooking, uh, personal story sharing. Uh, lots of really great opportunities for loose play. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were offering structured and unstructured and just giving families the opportunity to move fluidly and to express themselves however they need to express in a safe and controlled environment. So that is that. And um, yeah, lots to learn from the program in itself, lots of successes and lots of opportunity for reflection and thinking about how to be a very inclusive space and provide for what the families needed in the in that moment and in that time. So okay, back to you, Halima. Thank you everyone for your wonderful presentations. Um, I want to get started on the Q&A section. Uh, this is just a reminder for everyone to please put your questions in the Q&A chat below. Uh, first question is here for Sherry Lynn. Uh, could you tell us more about the mindful toolbox? Is this something we can create at home? So yes, definitely you can create it at home. We, um, for our online group, we take a tool a week and we'll say, okay, let me see if I've got a tool here. Uh, okay, I got it because I was just teaching the other day. <laughs> so we have like a jar of what we call like loving kindness stones. And we'll talk about what it is to culture that feeling of empathy and compassion. And we'll say, you know, when kids get home and they're struggling to go to bed at night and they've had a problem with the child during the day, um, it's hard to make that transition. So we'll say, we'll teach them about a loving kindness stones. So the kids can paint these. They do these when they're with us at Circle R Ranch. And so this is like, may I be happy? May I be lovable? And so they'll put all of the, to the stones in one hand and then they'll um, take a breath and put it into the other hand. So um, definitely like each time we'll use things like, like this as a mindful tool. Um, but there's so many different things that you can make. And we'll talk to the parents about making a peace corner or a place in their home where the kids can practice. So it's not a, to it's not a toy that can be used at any time. It's an actual tool where they're building that their self-regulation skills or they're, um, they're building their brain, for example. Um, and a lot of these tools come from Pinterest. Like, and, and I mean, a lot of the kids found them like teenagers have found them and brought them to class and then we'll say oh well let's add that to it um that's where the heartfulness tic-tac-toe came from one of the kids had a tree cookie and they said why don't we make a tic-tac-toe game and we'll use these stones so we always open it up to the kids too and they'll bring all kinds of tools to class to class or to our sessions at circle r that help them i don't know if that's helpful was that answering your question I think it was. Thank you, Sherry Lynn. Okay. The next question is for Jesse. Uh, could you talk a little more about how you include cultural exploration in your programming? Yeah, that's a really great question. So some of the things that we do um, specifically for cultural exploration is our cooking session. So it's exciting. What we try to do is get everybody, um, we bring the the recipe to the, to the families and then we break up the families into their 
family units and each family is responsible for um, a portion of that recipe. And the idea is that we offer enough ingredients and different uh, spices that they can do a reflection on who they are culturally and how they represent their family through cooking. And so the idea that we took last time was meatballs. Everybody had to make meatballs and they had to infuse their meatballs with a, a bit of their culture and how they associated the flavors and the spices and the ingredients um, with their family. And so that was really interesting because when everybody got to uh, cooking and working together in the kitchen, um, there was a lot of conversation about, you know, where they were from and who they were as individuals and uh, what made them who they were and how families celebrated tradition. And that uh, was really interesting. And then we all come together to eat together and celebrate and have that family moment where we sit together around the table. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Uh, next question again for Sherry Lynn. Could we adapt buddy breathing to use at home with family pets? Do you have any tips? Okay, can you hear me right now? Is that good? Okay. Yes. Yeah, we actually teach that um, when they bring their kids to class. And so buddy breathing, we always do a sensory walk before we do buddy breathing. So we'll get, um, let me just see. So we'll say, We'll take their little, little stuffed animal, we'll practice with a stuffed animal, and we'll say, fine. So we're using the sense of touch to bring them to the present moment and create that neural integration into their prefrontal cortex. And so we'll say to them, um, first, fine, we'll use temperature first. And we'll practice on the stuffed animal before we move to the actual pet. And so we'll say, okay, find the coolest part of your stuffed animal, find the warmest part find the roughest part, find the smoothest part. And then when we switch to their home pet, we'll say, and now you're gonna find the sweet spot, the spot where their animal actually responds to them. And um, so we'll give them the opportunity to practice. And then we'll talk a lot about what does it mean to interact with focusing on connection? We really wanna connect with this animal or we want to be, what does it, your hands feel like when you are, I'm touching the animal with kindness or gentleness or calmness. Like what do your hands look like? And then we'll take them and we'll, we'll do buddy breathing with a stuffed animal first and we'll get them to lie down and they'll put their, their animal, their stuffed animal on their chest and they're going to give it a gentle ride, depending on their age, of course. Right. Um, with teenagers, I still use stuffed animals. Like I still, I get the teen, the teenagers to bring a stuffed animal. I mean, they're little, they're, little kids in big bodies, right? And so we always practice with something like this first. And then, so we're just con focusing on our own breathing and then we'll move towards the animal and they'll bring a, I mean, one brought a bird, one kid brought a chicken. <laughs> That's just hilarious. And um, a lot of them brought dogs and cats, of course. And we'll talk a little bit about their respiration because I'll, I'll bring Theo or rabbit and rabbits have very fast respiration. And so when we when we buddy breathe with them, it can actually be, we'll say, oh, well, that's kind of invigorating. It's not really calming or energizing um, in comparison to a horse, for example, that has a much slower respiration than a bunny. So yeah, definitely lots of fun. Kids shift when they're around animals. Eh? They just, there's such a softening that happens. Super grateful for that. You, Sherry Lynn. Uh, Jesse, people with FASD often confabulate when they are telling stories. Do you suspect some participants are confabulating when they engage in your storytelling activities? Does this concern you, or do you think it's important that they share their story the way they choose? I love this question so much um, because even in our private practice where we have to be so cognizant as therapists that this might be occurring. Um, but really, we really do try to honor the individual and the stories that they're sharing. And then as we build a relationship with that individual and we build relationships with the families, we really do start to get a beautiful picture of who that individual is, their strengths, um, and we start to understand better the dynamics of the family. And so we can get a a better picture of if it's an accurate story or if it's more along the things that they've collected along the way and they're piecing together this story. Um, but really, it's just about honoring that individual and showing up and listening and being attentive and being responsive to them in a, in a compassionate and caring uh, way. And so 
it's something that we're always learning as practitioners how to support. I know that um, it is something we often see with individuals with FASD. And I like to imagine that it's like a puzzle, right? And where you have to take those puzzle pieces and put them together. And I always like to take really strong notes so that I can reflect on what they're saying and see if there's patterns along the way and then making sure that we're having those conversations with family and family members. Great Thank question. Though. I love that. <laughs> uh, Sherry Lynn, uh, someone is, wants to know how often are you offering the virtual training for youth? So we have done it for the last three years in the winter time, um, as um, we got the funding from Health Nexus uh, to offer that. Um, yeah, in the winter time, because during um, the spring and the summer and the and the um, fall, we do in-person training at Circle R Ranch. Thank you. Um, uh, Sherry Lynn, uh, what about kids who are afraid of animals? Have you had to deal with that? And did you have success? Yes, definitely. I, I We've always found it fascinating, especially for the in-person, um, where their parent, that we would say, so what do you notice? We get into a group with the, you know, we're in Rabbitropolis where all the rabbit cages are on the outside and we'll say, so what did you notice? Um, and one of the, invariably one child will say, I hate animals. <laughs> it's like, okay. So we always say, you know, it's totally fine. The training is mindfulness training. We happen to be at Circle R Ranch. Um, they don't have to interact with animals, but it is interesting because it's more, sometimes it's like a safety thing where they're, I mean, if we walk them up to a 17 hand horse, of course, that's like really overwhelming, but a baby bunny, it's like, it's like so, so tiny. And we'll often say, you know, sweethearts, you don't have to come into this area where we're practicing. You can practice outside. And we always have stuffed, stuffed animals to practice with, um, but we've never had we've never ever in all the years that we've done this training we've never had a child not participate so sometimes they'll say you can't make me participate you know and it's like no i know we can't but we get to hang out together for the next period of time so aren't we so lucky and um and then invariably they stop and animals are like just they're so funny right i mean how can you not want to interact with a baby goat because they're like jumping around and flinging their legs out and it's um we just let the animals do their magic and uh and it shifts it's it's incredible to watch really it's a privilege thank you uh i'm going to direct this next question to the both of you what is the best way to find out about each of your upcoming programs do you have a mailing list Uh, yes, <laughs> I'll just uh, say that first. Yeah, um, you can find out more about us by Googling Jess Jones Recreation Therapy. Um, we're often doing things as organizations, and then I often do a lot independently, of course. Um, and we have a mailing list. If you visit us at www.jessjonesrecreationtherapy.ca, I can put it in the chat for everybody. Um, you can you can sign on to the mailing list um, and easily find out what we're doing. So you can reach me at two different spots. Uh, mindfulme.ca is my um, website, but I, it is in the process of being revamped right now. It's going to uh, have a new launch as of June first, but I still you can still contact me through that mindfulme.ca or circlerranch.ca um, is where you can see some of the programs that we offer in person with horses. Um, I go out to schools and do a lot of training um, in schools um, and with families and things like that. You can see that on the Mindful Me website. So two different spots. I'll put them in the chat. Yeah, that would be great if both of you could do that. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, I'm just going to make sure there's no other one over here. Okay. Uh, Jesse, if I wanted to run something similar in my community, do I need a recreation therapist to run it? Well, this is such a great question. Okay, so <laughs> I love this. Um, so there's, in, it's interesting, because really, like, recreation therapists don't own recreation and leisure. Um, so of course, just as in art therapy, artists 
art therapists don't own art. You really do have the ability to provide these programs in your community. I think where um, a recreation therapist comes into our program is that we are trained professionals who are using um, therapy-based theory and models and techniques and the schooling that we've learned and the approach in which we facilitate. Um, that is what probably sets our programs apart from uh, recreation versus therapeutic recreation. So if you're looking for your programs to be therapeutic in nature and have that element of therapy, then I would say yes, a recreation therapist would be um, appropriate. However, if you're looking to just have a rec program, then of course you can go ahead and do that without a recreation therapist. I think the biggest difference when we look at rec therapy programming and recreation programming is therapeutic recreation always has a mandate for change, right? We're looking for um, uh, some type of improvement based on evidence, pra uh, evidence based practice, so research, and we're attaching goals and objectives to those things in a way that is facilitating change in people. Um, I'd like to say that, you know, a mandate for treatment, but we really don't like to look at it like we're treating individuals because that is not what we're doing, but we are doing, um, we are creating a standardized program that follows the theories and models in which therapeutic recreation follows. So those are the biggest differences. So if you are looking to do this program in your community, by means, if you're not looking for that therapeutic approach, you could totally just take the inspiration from the program and then facilitate it in a leisure-based way. I hope that answers your question. Thank you to the both of you. Uh, thank you to our speakers for this wonderful presentation and for participants for listening from across the province. Take care, everyone, and stay tuned for more virtual training meetings by Health Nexus.